So what are you going to ask me? Tell me. What, are, what I'm going to ask you is um, first to describe what you... Um, how would you describe the science of qualities that um, you describe mm -hmm. at, in the Masters? Yeah, yeah, okay. okay. Start with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we've only got 10 minutes, so it, like, and then right. I was hoping to ask you something about um, where you see the place of eco-villages in the move towards sustainability. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. a different project. Yeah, yeah. And um, then about uh, how the Masters in Holistic Science came about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, hopefully, I've got time to ask something about Goethe as well. Where you, where you sure. Start. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's fine. Okay. It's so, your fix. Yeah. Um, okay, so could you describe what you understand um, uh, under the idea of the science of qualities and, and how it differs from conventional science? Yeah. The science of qualities is really an extension of conventional science in the sense that. Uh, it depends upon consensus and agreement and a methodology whereby people come to recognize the, the agreement they have or the consensus they have about the qualities of experience of other beings. And these other beings could be other animals, they can be uh, landscapes, they could be an organization, a room, a building, whatever it may be. And, of course, we live our lives in terms of qualities, more than quantities. Quantities have become important, but it's the qualities that really give the texture and the quality to our lives and our relationships. And relationships have become primary in the new science of networks. Then we have to recover this whole area of qualities, and there are systematic ways now of uh, demonstrating that the people reach consensus very effectively about the qualities of experience of farm animals, about the quality that is expressed in a landscape, the quality of a river, uh, and so on. And these, these are things that people have always done spontaneously, it's common sense, and it's been excluded from science, but now we need to bring it back in as a part of an extension of science of quantities into qualities. And, um to what extent did the work of uh, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe um, play into the science of qualities in uh -huh. an early stage? Well, of course, I mean, Goethe is such a wonderful example of um, a holistic scientist. And it's more than science. I mean, it, it, he, he obviously was a holistic human in the sense that he was doing art and science. And he was using the, uh, the approach of phenomenology to observe the qualities of beings as well as their quantities. He put the two together. And the systematic way of exploring the natural world, and when I say natural world, I mean everything. I'm not distinguishing, distinguishing between nature and culture. Uh, and, and so that's the unification that's being achieved. And Goethe is a wonderful example of um, how, you can, how you can do that systematically and integrate all the different ways of knowing the intuitive, the sensory, the feeling, and the analytical, so the thinking. And you put all those together and you've got, you've got an integrated way of knowing the world and acting in it consensively. And um, how did the idea of setting up a Masters of, uh, in Holistic Science come about, and, and can you tell a little bit about the story, how, it, how you actually um, set it up? Yeah. Yes, I had always, ever since um, my experiences at, at the University of Sussex in the 60s and 70s, when you had that a kind of period of enlightenment. I mean, the 60s phenomenon was pretty remarkable, and at Sussex it was really very well developed. And so it, uh, it gave me a sense that we need to, to some extent, abolish the boundaries between traditional subjects, but not lose any of the rigor. Now that sounds contradictory, but you can be very rigorous in your, your, your thinking and your analysis while at the same time you are encompassing the whole range of these different ways of knowing. Now that's a bit of a challenge, and it's something I, d I didn't know what the solution was to it, and I still don't. But 
I was exploring that at the University of Sussex and then at the Open University. But there are boundaries to academic permission. And so when I came to Schumacher in 19, what was it, 1996, um, I was really rather astonished to realize that it was possible to explore this territory of holistic science, systematically grounding it in chaos, complexity, and Gaia theories, and incorporating all these different components. And of course, with Stefan Harding, uh, together we, we constructed this program, it was accepted by Plymouth, and the, the bits that have been uh, not adequately developed and are still being developed are the areas of experiential learning and practical engagement with the land and with buildings and this um, implementation of the principles of holistic science in holistic living. So that's where, that's where the Masters uh, has been going for the last four years, five years, uh, but it's been a slow development. And now I think there's need for a real push in that direction. That's what we're getting. So do you, do you see that there's a, um, when, when you say holistic living, that, that links very strongly into the current um, climate change response mm -hmm. and, and, and the um, need for increased sustainability. Yeah. Um, what are the movements where you see, like, is, is permaculture or the eco-village movement possibly part of um, a, a more holistic way of li living? And, yeah. and how do you see these grassroots um, movements contribute? It's absolutely essential. I mean, what, what we are now doing at the college is, is turning what we call lawn culture, this monoculture of lawns, into permaculture agroforestry, following Martin Crawford's inspiration and other people in the Open Bill Mollison and others. It's this whole vision of having something beautiful, natural, productive, low maintenance. And so that is the direction in, in which the college is moving and we want to move the whole estate. And of course, with Transition Town Totnes, we want to have a cooperative engagement in this whole process of putting into operation uh, a sustainable, holistic community. And have an example here in, in the southwest of how this is this is going to be achieved, and that is beginning to move in the direction of implementation in a way that I think is very exciting. We don't know we know the direction in which we're going. We don't know what the outcome is going to be. Nobody does, and we don't know how long it's going to take. But we know what we have to do, and we're sort of getting on with it. And um, this whole idea of steering into the future without knowing necessarily where you're going uh, um, and is somehow informed by some of the insights that you uh, gained through your long engagement with complexity theory. Could you say a little bit more about um, the lessons that complexity theory and, and your experiences at the Santa Fe Institute um, sure. contribute? Sure. Yeah. But complexity theory <coughs> was the, in a sense, the uh, it opened a scientific window onto this way of knowing the world because it said, look, we cannot, we cannot predict what happens in, in complex systems. They're just, they're, they're, there's too rich a set of interactions. And so what we have to do is work with complex systems, feel them, use your intuition and your feelings uh, to, to get a sense of how things are moving and to move them in the right direction. This has to be done consensually in the group. But at the same time, uh, this connects with Goethe's approach, which is the quantities qualities, and the artistic as well as the, the scientific analytical. So it's art, science, craft, technology, business, commerce. Everything is now joined together. And these uh, communities, um, eco-village communities or whatever you want to call them, these new communities for holistic living are embodying these integrated principles. Now, complexity was the route we used to convince the University of Plymouth that, that this was a legitimate and valid and scientific, scientifically well-grounded way of proceeding. But it's gone far beyond that now, and in some sense, common sense validates this, but backed up by, again, rigorous observation, 
we're doing research in this area and so things are moving in a way that I think uh, combine the, the elements of intuition, thinking, feeling, sensing. As I mentioned before, the Jungian mandala is becoming a unity in these holistic patterns of, of living, lifestyles. And um, from my experience of, of doing the, the Masters, one of the big lessons that, that came out of complexity theory and chaos theory was the switch from um, a mindset of um, prediction and control mm -hmm. to um, one of participation and, and the realization that uh, complex systems, the, the, the big complex system in which we are taking part, mm -hmm. um, is fundamentally unpredictable and uncontrollable. Could, could you kind of... Yes, that's the whole idea of you know, living on the edge of chaos or experiencing the world coming into being. It's actually, I mean, yeah, this, this is a Goethean or Henry Bortoff develops this a lot. And it's this idea that everything is always coming into being and we need to experience the world as a process. Now, given that this is fundamental, we cannot predict what the outcome is going to be, but we can feel the direction in which this is moving. And it's that sense of uh, engagement and participation and a deep involvement in the present, not concern about the future, but actually being very sensitive to all the elements that are working now. And that's what I think is the process of, <clears throat> you know, living in the eternal present because we cannot predict the future. And so the, the more present you are, the, the better will be your antennae for working out what the right direction is. So it's the journey. It's not the goal. It's the journey. This is perennial wisdom. This is classical. It's in Buddhism. It's in Christianity, if you look at the, f the fundamentals of it. It's in any religion. It's in indigenous cultures. This is perennial wisdom. This is what we're getting back to, I think, or getting on to and embodying that together with all the technology and the know-how and the analytical uh, knowledge that we have at our disposal. Great. Time Thank to go.